Welcome to the American Geophysical Union's podcast about the scientists and the methods behind the science. These are the stories you won't read in the manuscript or hear in a lecture. I'm Shane Hanlon. And I'm Nancy Bompey. And this is Third Pod from the Sun. So, Nancy, you're, you don't have a science background, right? You're a journalist by training. I have a degree in chemistry, Shane. You do? Yes. Oh, crap. I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. All right. I apologize. Not a PhD, but I do have a bachelor's degree in chemistry and I worked as a chemist. Okay. Well, yeah. that's I legitimately did not know that. So I learned something new every day. <laughs> uh, but no, what I actually wanted to ask you about is there was uh, – there was we were kind of joking in the office sometime last year about uh, you being an honorary oceanographer. What like what was that about? So yes, well I do have a degree in chemistry. I do not have a background in in geoscience, but a couple years ago. One of the editors of one of our journals here at AGU invited me to go on an ocean research cruise with him, you know, and his team out in Oregon. They're at Oregon State University. So I went on um, an ocean research cruise. It was just off the coast of Oregon for a few days, but it was awesome. Got to do the whole thing. Got to sleep on the boat. Got to help them with the CTDs, which is this very common oceanography thing. Got to see them in the lab, stay up late, had some rocky seas. So it was really cool. I think I'm a f- definitely an oceanographer after that, basically. <laughs> I have to say I'm jealous. I, I am a, I guess we're both scientists by training, uh, uh-huh. but I, I, I pursued science, but I didn't get to do anything quite that exciting. I, I My most exciting, I guess, voyage was riding around on dinghies in ponds, setting up turtle traps. So I definitely, uh, I got to say I'm a little jealous. It was pretty cool. It was pretty sweet. <laughs> well, I will say though, so you are an, let's say, honorary oceanographer, and I've never quite had the experience or the opportunity to be part of that. But maybe we can live vicariously through an actual oceanographer. And so for that, let's bring in our producer, Joanna Wendell. Hi, Joanna. Hey, Shane. So what do you got for us? So I have a story for you about the place where ocean meets ice. So this ice covers about 10% of Earth's surface, much of it in the form of vast sheets or glaciers. And glaciers, which are like huge tongues of ice that slide and grind across the Earth, are a real hot topic in climate change these days. These glaciers creep and retreat as our climate changes over millions and millions of years. Even parts of the United States were once covered in glaciers at one point. But right now, scientists are concerned with how human activities cause these glaciers to melt and retreat. So things like releasing too much greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide or methane, this traps heat in the atmosphere and warms it up, causing glaciers to melt and retreat. Industrial activities like farming and burning fossil fuels and forests also send a lot of dust and soot into the atmosphere, which also end up falling on the glaciers and causing them to melt and retreat. It's this huge, complicated process, and scientists use a lot of tools to study each little tiny piece of that puzzle. And to learn more about how scientists study glaciers, I talked to this guy, Dave Sutherland, an oceanographer at the University of Oregon. So, back to Oregon which uh, also happens to be my alma mater. So Dave and his colleagues have recently been studying this glacier called Lakanti in southeastern Alaska, and they take these research cruises up there, you know, every couple of years. So let's hear from Dave about what he's doing. I study where fresh water meets salty water, so places in the ocean where rivers meet the ocean or uh, solid, solid fresh water like ice, where ice meets the ocean. But it's really where I think the most interesting questions are, is where people live in, in particular. Estuaries are, are where the majority, the coastal ocean is where the majority of, of people live in the world. Mm-hmm. And then in the high latitude, say, uh, around the Arctic or Antarctic, it turns out that the areas around ice sheets and glaciers, where they meet the ocean is really where a lot of change is happening. It's where we need to understand the processes that are going to control sea level rise, for instance. So if mm-hmm. you want to understand how global climate change is affecting our world, we need to understand where the ice meets the ocean. The research we've done over the last two years took place in Lakanti Glacier in Lakanti Bay in southeast Alaska. We call it a a tidewater glacier or a marine terminating glacier, and that just means that the ice that drains a big ice field up in the mountains actually drains down into the ocean and it empties into the ocean, so it calves off icebergs. Water runs off directly into the ocean. And so it's in that environment of sort of a swirly mix of, of ocean currents and bergy bits and icebergs that we were trying to get our measurements. We went to Alaska, actually, to study the 
physics of a situation where, that we think applies not just to Alaska glaciers, but also to Greenland glaciers, to Western Arctic Peninsula glaciers, to Patagonian glaciers. I mean, it's really what does the ocean do to the underside of these tidewater glacial systems? Mm -hmm. So the ocean, obviously, when you put ice in water that's warmer than the freezing point, it melts. But what we really under, want to understand is the rate of that melt and where it happens. So that's the main question is what control does the ocean have on the melt rates of these glaciers? If we can understand that, then we might understand how the glacier calves. So by calving, I mean how ice chunks break off and become icebergs. Why Leconte? What's so special about this glacier? So actually, the people near this glacier have been studying it since the 1970s. If you know anything about Alaska, it's very alive. It's very uh, wild. There's eagles, there's whales, there's seals, there's salmon, there's goats. There's, you know, the, the mountains are high. There's ice everywhere. And so it's this really sort of adventurous place. Everyone has a sort of a feel for nature there because they spend time out in it. To go to Lacan Glacier, you fly in and out of a town called Petersburg, Alaska. And it's this really small town, you know, like 2,000 people, but they're really connected to the ocean. So everyone has a fishing boat, or they're connected, or they know someone with a boat, or they hunt, or they trap. And so everyone's really interested in what's happening with the glacier and what's happening in Lacan. And so it, it, it's fun just to walk around town and, and meet people, and, they, and you talk to them, and um, you explain what you're doing. And they, they often they, they have a really excellent knowledge of, of the ocean there as well. And so they, they not only want to hear what you say, but they actually tell us things as well as scientists. And so it's really a, it's one of those areas where we can learn a lot of scientists just by listening to, to the local people. It was a program started by the local high school, started surveying the glacier back in the, I want to say the 1970s, where they, every year they take high schoolers up to look at the glacier and they take pictures and they survey it, they, they trace out where it is. And it was in the 1990s that they noticed that this glacier was starting to move back rapidly. And they contacted some scientists at the University of Alaska, who's one of the, the co-scientists on this project that we're involved in. And so that led to, a, you know, for the past 20 years, people have been studying this system in some degree or the other. And it was really because of the local engagement with their environment. That's cool. But I mean, they've been taking these measurements for so long. Why? So what they want to know is what happens to the glacier as ocean waves continually lap against its face, especially that place hundreds of meters under the water, that part you can't see with your eyes or observe with a satellite. The underwater environment is always the most challenging part to see. Right? We have amazing satellite data these days. Right? You can go on Google Earth and you can, you can go look at all these glacial systems and fjords down to really high resolution. You know, you can, you can identify people and cars, but if you try to look under the ocean, right, you can't do that from satellites. And so as an oceanographer, we have to go out in ships and think of ways to image the underside of these, not just the ocean, but the underside of these glaciers that end often in really deep fjords. So we're talking about fjords that are hundreds of feet deep, half a mile deep sometimes. I and mean, so you just, uh, a lot of the action is happening. I mean, literally like the tip of the iceberg is like a real thing. And so we really want to understand the rest of the, the, the story there is most, mm -hmm. most of the story is underneath the water. All right. Well, but I want to know how do they study what's happening underneath the water, right? Because it's really cold. It's dark for half the year. They've got these giant icebergs floating around. So what gives? So, okay, let's start from the beginning. So these scientists, 12 of them usually, go out on an ocean research vessel that's normally a fishing boat, and they spend like a week and a half just kind of sailing back and forth in front of this glacier, gathering as much data as possible in that time period, and they use a lot of different instruments. So we had a science crew, and then there's a crew on the boat who was operating the ship the whole time, so we didn't have to worry about operating the ship, luckily. And then we ran all the instruments as well. So we had a team of about 12 people on board running 24 hours so all day, all night, rain, no rain, whatever conditions we had. And so we get on board, and there's only maybe five bunks, and we have 12 people for a science crew. And so we had to do what's called hot bunking, which means that there's always people awake. I and mean, so you share a bunk with another person because you don't ever sleep at the same time. And so the galley, which is what the galley is what in the ship is where you eat dinner, where the food is cooked. It's like the kitchen. That's sort of the center of this boat. There's the galley, and then there's the outside, the back deck. So when I wake up, you know, you go out into the galley, you go look on the back deck, and there's always something going on. 
There's either like the crane lowering something into the water. There's people attaching instruments to things, taking instruments apart, looking at data on their computers. There's always a lot of activity going on. And then, and then there's the crew. There's the cook making food in the galley. There's the captain and his mate up on the bridge, sort of making sure that we're safe. And so there's, there's a lot of activity that every day it was different, but sort of the same activities going on from day to day. So when I would wake up, I was on the, the 4 p.m. to 4 a.m. shift. I would check in with my other, other lead scientists on the boat and say, hey, what's been going on? Like, what are we, what's the plan for the next 12 hours? And we'd sort of develop a plan and go from there. My favorite part about being in the field is just being totally focused on one thing. You know, we, we don't get cell coverage there. We don't get internet access. And so it's really nice to unplug and just focus in on, on this one thing, right? We're collecting data that we're going to use for the rest of the year. And so my favorite part is just being out, outdoors, really, for 10 to 14 days at a time and not really worrying about what's happening in the world elsewhere. And so that's really nice. It's, uh, it keeps you going the rest of the time when you're sitting in front of your computer, you know, banging your head on the wall about your data and, and everything else, or your code not working. So that's my favorite part. And working in Alaska was just... Uh, you know, the icing on the cake and that just seeing all the wildlife and the, and the friendly people and knowing that what you're doing actually matters to these people was just an amazing experience. I gotta say, hearing this is making me long for some time outside of D.C. And it sounds like the people and the atmosphere, like everything there was just so amazing. But I'm assuming they actually got a lot of work done. So what were they actually looking at? So they were looking at this thing called a subglacial plume, and that's basically a stream of fresh water coming out from the bottom of the glacier underwater. This water starts uh, as ice on the top of the glacier, and then it melts in the sunlight, and that water streams down through the cracks and the crevices in the glacier, sometimes making caves, and it flows out of the bottom. Because the subglacial plume is made of fresh water, when it spurts out of the glacier at the bottom, it actually rises because the water around it is saltier. And it kicks up this salty, slightly warmer seawater and drags it upwards, which can help to melt the face of the glacier. But the thing is, this subglacial plume comes out 230 meters underwater. That's not really a place that scientists can or want to go. Right now, the study of the near-glacier environment is really hampered by the fact that we lack some technology to make these measurements under the water. And so it, it was actually a lot of our thought process was, was how are we going to make these measurements and how are we going to do it in a way that we can compare to maybe standard methods or, you know, have a couple different ways to measure something so that we can make sure that we're doing it right. What we needed measurements of were the underwater environment. And so we, we took some techniques that were commonly used for other applications, so mapping the seafloor, and we adjusted those or adapted those to our own application. So in particular, we care about, well, how the water moves. So we care about the, we call it the ocean circulation. And so the, the water moving around tells us something about the source of that water. So is it coming from the glacier or is it coming in from the outside of the fjord? Because it's that, the movement of that water that also helps it uh, erode or melt away the glacier. And then the temperature of the water. So we, we use instruments to measure the temperature of the water all the way down to the bottom. So from the surface, we lower it all the way down to the bottom, so 600 feet. 800 feet down, and then how salty the water is as well. And then what we did was that we used uh, what's called a, a multi-beam sonar. You can think of it just as a fancy fish finder, so like an echo sounder that you would, it just sends sound waves, they bounce off uh, usually the bottom of the ocean. And so what that is, it just looks like a big, you know, maybe a, a three feet long black box that you stick on a pole, and then you stick that pole underneath the water off the side of the boat. And it sends out sound pulses, and those sound pulses then bounce back off whatever surface is out there. You know, it could be the seafloor, or it could be the ice itself. And so we were going back and forth in front of the glacier, sending these sound pulses out. They were hitting the, the glacier surface, and then coming back to our boat, and we would record that distance, basically. In this case, we tilted it to look at the ice face, and so we were actually directly imaging the underside of, of the glacier. And if you do that repeatedly, then you can actually see how the underside of the glacier changes while you also are collecting the ocean data and everything else um, at the same time. So I'm assuming they just couldn't take out their iPhone and take a picture, right? 
Right. <laughs> they also wanted to see, you know, what was going on with the glaciers. So they used a couple of actually different ki- kinds of drones. They had drones that could be flown in the air. And they also had these remotely operated boats, uh, which are like kayaks with engines in them. And they go right up to the face of the glacier, which is not where you or I want to be. I was actually the drone operator. I am official FAA certified, part 107. I could even fly commercial if I get fired from my day job here. So I flew the drone. Luckily, we're in the area where there's no, there's no airports nearby. There's, there's none of the stuff you have to worry about if you're trying to fly something in a city, for instance. We were never over top of any people. We might have been over top of some seals, but there you go. They also had these remotely operated boats called robotic oceanographic surface samplers to study the glacier face even more closely. The remotely operated boats are actually just heavily modified kayaks that they make commercially available. This company called Mokai makes kayaks that you can that have jet engines in them. And my colleague Jonathan Nash at Oregon State modifies them to collect oceanographic data at the same time. But the boats are also a little more expendable than, say, human life. And so we can send them up to the glacier front uh, where they might get hit by an iceberg or a chunk of ice calving off, whereas, you know, we won't go up to the glacier front on the real research vessel. Okay, so one more thing about the boats, though. Two of them have names, and there's a really fun story about how they got those names. One of the, f- the first trips we took there in August of 2016, you know, we get, we get into town a few days early to set up the boat and to test things out. And then at nighttime, you know, we take a few hours off every once in a while. And so we were walking around Petersburg, and this woman, June Marion, who works at Oregon State, noticed a a sign outside the Sons of Norway Hall in Petersburg, Alaska, that said, wedding reception tonight, open to all. And at first, we didn't think anything of that until we started talking to some other locals, and they were like, oh, yeah, there's this wedding happening, and you have to be invited to the wedding, but the reception is open to all. And we went, we said, okay, well, open to all, what does that mean? And they went, oh, everyone in the town is invited. And that just sort of blew our minds. And so we, um, we decided to go because we'd met some people locally. And June was really excited to go and sort of see the local scene. And so we went to this red- wedding reception at the Sons of Norway Hall. And the, the couple that was getting married were named Rosie and Casey. And we met them. And they were very nice. And we, and we were so inspired by, by their wedding and their openness and their sort of just their welcoming nature, which was really representative of the whole community that June decide to name the boats after them. All right, life goal. Get a science boat named after me. Nancy, maybe we should start talking to scientists we know to get some Shane and Nancy boats out there. Totally. But as fun as boat naming sounds, it can't all just be fun and games out there, right? Right. So it turns out there's probably a lot of ways that you can die when you're on a boat in the middle of a bunch of icebergs. So from a a safety point of view, Obviously, when you go into these fjords on a ship, you're not going super fast. So there's no risk of like doing a Titanic, right? Where you're going to run into an iceberg at such a speed that you blow a hole in, in the hole. But what can happen is you can get scrunched or crunched by icebergs coming together. Or, you know, repeated hole bashing by ice is not good for the boat. And so you can weaken the hole. So there are safety concerns, like real safety concerns of operating in these areas. And then once you're close to the glacier... You have to worry about really large calving events. The Conk Glacier sort of calves off these, we call them small bergs, but they're, they're sort of car-sized bergs and, and, and bergy bits. And, and those are fine, like they create waves that you can just ride out. But if a really large, you know, full-width iceberg calved off, you wouldn't want to be very close to the glacier because it could... It could lead to a, you know, in the best situation, your boat just rocks a lot and everything falls off the shelves and everyone sort of falls over and maybe lose some equipment. In the worst case, your boat gets swamped and maybe lose someone off the back deck or or something like that. And so those are the things that we have in the back of our minds when we're working there. And so we take that all into consideration. And I don't think we didn't do anything that was unsafe in this field work. We were definitely close in pushing the, the boundary, I think. But we were always within a, a distance where a piece of ice wouldn't have come up underneath us and, and hit us. That's the other worst case scenario, is that these glaciers can sometimes have toes or things that stick out underneath, and they might just pop up underneath your boat. And that's, that's when you, you don't know that it's coming. Okay, this is freaking terrifying. Imagine watching a piece break off thinking, oh, good thing we weren't under that, and then it comes up from below. 
Well, okay, that wouldn't probably happen, but, you know, despite the dangers, Dave loves working at this glacier. It's not as, you know, large or maybe awe-inspiring as glaciers in Greenland or Antarctica, but Alaska is just beautiful. And the work they're doing can really help us understand the hundreds of glaciers around the world. The real sort of ultimate goal for this is to inform these big climate models, right, that include everything. They include oceans, they include ice sheets, they include the atmosphere. They have to do all this at a scale where they're not actually, they can't see an individual fjord or an individual glacier. So what they do is they have to parameterize things. So they have to come up with a way to say, what is the effect of that process? In this case, ocean melt, how the ocean melts glaciers. How do they include that in their model, in their big climate model? And so what we're doing is going to help inform those climate models to say, well, how do you take that into account? Because this is really an important process because this is ice sheet change account for one third to one half of all sea level rise currently. And so we have to, we have to get it right. That's the goal. So Nancy, does this make you want to become an actual oceanographer? So it sounds super cool, but honestly, I think those three days on a boat uh, with those scientists from Oregon were enough for me. And uh, if you want to find out more, check out my story about this research on eos.org. All right, folks, that's all from Third Pod from the Sun. Special thanks to Joanna for bringing us this story and editing this interview. And of course, thanks to Dave for sharing his amazing project with us. Uh, this podcast is also produced with help from Lauren LaPuma, Josh Spicer, Olivia Ambrosio, and Caitlin Camacho. And thanks to Kayla Surrey for producing this episode. AG would love to hear your thoughts about this podcast. Please rate and review us. Um, and of course, you can find new episodes at your favorite podcasting app or on our website, thirdpodfromthesun.com. Thanks all, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.